Okay, I'll start then. Okay. Good morning to one and all present here. I extend a very warm welcome to all those attending this talk as part of the plenary lecture series. I kindly request the audience to drop the questions in the chat. They will be addressed in the Q&A session. Recent years has seen a rise in the number of women aspiring to be in STEM, a significant reason being the inspiring stories of the women professors and researchers who spearheaded this change. Joining us today is one such professor from the Department of Chemical Engineering, IIT Madras. She is an ITM 1995 graduate who pursued her higher studies at the University of Rochester, the University of Massachusetts, and Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She's a coordinator for the Young Research Fellowship Program, which encourages young graduate students to pursue research as a career path. Um, I'm sorry, undergraduate students. Her primary areas of research are coal gasification, reactor modeling, and automotive emission. As a one of her students, I can unequivocally state that her passion for this field and enthusiasm are highly contagious. She makes a constant effort in making the process of learning a fun one by engaging her students in innovative activities during her lectures. She also loves to run marathons and blogs in her leisure time. Please join me in welcoming this professor who has seemingly mastered the art of multitasking, Dr. Preeti Agalia. Thank you. Thank you, Mrinalini. Uh, thank you, everyone, for this opportunity. It's a great pleasure to uh, talk to you all sort of outside of the uh, regular uh, classroom. Um, it would have been nice to do this in person, uh, I think, but I believe we are also making the best of uh, the situation we are in. So this has been, uh, it's, it's become quite comfortable to do these interactions online. What I'm going to do, I have a presentation that I have uh, put together, which I'll share on the screen with you and you can see that. But I also need you to uh, you know, uh, be active on your mobiles because I have some polls. I want to know a few, of, uh, few opinions from you as we go along and have this. Uh, it's a, I guess it's a lecture slash talk by me. But as Mrinalini will vouch, there's a lot of opportunities for whoever's in the audience to also uh, express their opinions. Um, so that is, that is the plan. Hope that works for uh, you all. So first, a little bit of uh, a break while I go and share my screen. Okay, so I have uh, titled my presentation in, in terms of the slides that I've put together as women in STEM, which was what the students asked me to uh, speak on. But of course, I'm a chemical engineer uh, through and through, like very sort of pure chemical engineer or all the Rochester, Massachusetts, wherever I've been, I've been in chemical engineering departments. So I couldn't resist putting that colon and saying that we are going to be this is going to be a very chemical engineering uh, heavy discussion. Um, so what I want to sort of make sure that you understand what we'll talk about, just a few things. One is my own uh, academic journey. Uh, I've called it the lonely road. Uh, hopefully you'll see why I'm not lonely or anything. I have lots and lots of friends, but there's a reason why I have put those words over there. I also want to talk a little bit about uh, what are motivating factors for women in STEM slash chemical engineering. And again, from my personal perspective, talk a little bit about numbers and what is called the leaky pipeline, a particularly uh, enamoring term for uh, chemical engineers because we do so much with flow in pipes and so on as well. I also want to spend a little bit of time uh, with this young audience articulating the challenges and the mountains that or maybe at least hillocks that uh, women have to climb as they go along in their STEM journey. And I want to always uh, leave the uh, end uh, at the end of the session with a positive message and a look at the future and a little bit of articulation of what each of us in this room can do to make the future a little bit better for everyone, not just women. Um, I, will, I, I would be, I guess, once given the platform, I asked them, what should I talk about? Is it okay to talk about my research? And they said, it's fine. And my research scholars will also be happy when I uh, refer to the work that they do. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the work that I do as a, a chemical engineering academic. 
I've always been in academia, by the way, throughout. Uh, in fact, my uh, parents are also academicians, so I also grew up in sort of a university type of uh, environment. Um, and there are three aspects I think I can divide my uh, professional work into. One is research, where as um, Rinalini said, I work with uh, uh, automotive catalysis. I work on a concept called underground coal gasification um, as well, and also something to do with soot. And I will talk a little bit more about these uh, three aspects in the next few slides. I also am very, very passionate about teaching. And in fact, it is one of my strong reasons to be in academia. Um, and I, I think it was in eighth standard or so, I said that I do want to be a professor. Um, first I said scientist, then I said a professor in some sort of science field is what I said. And in these past years, I have taught mostly um, chemical reaction engineering. Hopefully that's a term that's familiar to you. And you've been somewhat awake in some classes of chemical reaction engineering and kinetics through the course of your uh, undergraduate and graduate study. Uh, I also work on modeling catalytic reactions and I do teach an elective course that focuses on that. I've taught fluid mechanics in the past. And in recent times, I've been doing process calculations, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, is the class that um, Renani was in. Um, it's been it, for the past couple of uh, terms, I would say, I've been teaching process calculations, which is the intro uh, course to chemical engineering. I also do this elective called Let Us Play to Learn. A few chemical engineering students have uh, um, taken up this course. and. It, I don't have much time to talk about it, but we can definitely catch up online on all the fun that we have uh, and do over there. It is a, uh, I mean, the, the play is all for uh, uh, STEM things, math and chemical engineering and so on, but it's really, really fun. So it, it's uh, it rekindled a lot of my original passion for uh, teaching actually. Uh, because I, I've been working with uh, a colleague of mine, Karthik Vaidyanathan, on this particular course. I've also worked uh, variously on uh, uh, aspects of gender awareness, uh, safety for women in our uh, beautiful, beautiful campus. And uh, I think Milania also mentioned that I coordinate the Young Research uh, Fellowship Program, where also we have a little focus on ensuring that uh, there is equitable numbers. And I've been doing, in COVID times, I've been doing this uh, lecture series, Women in STEM lecture series, where I'm on the other side. I'm usually the interviewer or at least the organizer uh, of these sessions through the NPTEL uh, platform. And that's been going really well. We've had some really rich discussions on this topic. And, you know, a lot of, uh, of course, there is my experience as a woman in STEM, but there's also a lot of learnings from listening to, just listening to the experiences of um, other women in uh, STEM. It's very IIT Madras focused at this point of time. So every person that I have interviewed in this series is an IIT Madras uh, student, uh, research scholar or uh, faculty. And we've learned so much from this. So it's available on YouTube and uh, you know maybe when you have some time, you can check it out. These are very long 90 minute sessions um, with discussions and questions and so on. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll first talk a little bit about my uh, research. Uh, yeah, nine minutes into this, hopefully not for very long, just a quick brush on and the type of problems we solve in my research group. First is this thing called underground coal gasification. Um, it's, um, yeah, if I gave myself 30 seconds to describe what is underground coal gasification, it's very challenging to do, I will give it a shot. It's basically in situ utilization of uh, coal resources, which means no mining, no sort of digging up the coal, transporting this messy substance long distances, and then utilizing it at the end of that train ride or whatever. Wherever the coal seam is to be found, we perform the reactions uh, there itself. And this could be fairly deep underground, um, maybe 200, 300 meters or even beyond wherever they're located is uh, where we will utilize the coal is the idea. Um, it's not in entirely commercial yet. There have only been small pockets of commercialization across the world, but the prognosis seems good and it affords certain advantages which uh, we are keen to go after, especially for India. 
One is that uh, we have a, about 30% of our coal is too deep underground to be mined uh, economically, which means that if this flies, if this technique really goes forward, then we can get so much additional um, resource in, into the mix. The other is that it's fairly flexible. We can go forward with electricity generation or synthesis of chemicals. <clears throat> Excuse me, there's no bar on that. So that's another reason why this technique is attractive. The last is that it affords some sort of um, a synergy with uh, carbon capture and sequestration. That's that CCS that's mentioned in the bottom of this slide. And um, I think you will recognize that in the future, there's going to be any electricity or energy generation technique that you talk about, you have to simultaneously talk about what are you going to do with the carbon dioxide that you will generate from it, if at all. Of course, you generate a lot of carbon dioxide from coal uh, utilization and uh, sort of uh, ca capturing it and sequestering it uh, is possible in the design of the UCG inherently. So it affords or give us that, gives us that advantage as well. So this is why we're interested in it. This schematic shows you um, what we did in the lab to sort of simulate what happens uh, under the ground. Uh, we call this micro UCG because it's a small, tiny bit of coal that we are gasifying in the lab. Uh, the black stuff is coal and we've put some bricks around it and we've uh, dug holes to inject reactant materials and take out product gas materials. So the reaction is going to go on inside the uh, coal block itself in, in our experiments. These are high temperature, uh, typically also slightly elevated pressures, though in the lab we've done it at atmospheric pressure. So there's all kinds of very interesting uh, aspects to worry about, all kinds of problems to solve as well. For me, it's really interesting because it feels like nature's own chemical reactor, right? There's no walls to build, etc. because it's there. I mean, it, it, wherever the coal is to be found is where the reactor is. So if I draw control volume around the coal seam that I'm planning to use, that is my reactor no reactor to build. So for me, that uh, was very attractive. And all the combination of you know, mass transport and thermodynamics and heat transfer phenomena, and most importantly, all the chemical reactions at high temperatures that occur, the rate at which this reaction occurs, what is inhibiting it? Um, how can it quench the reaction in case the heat runaway is, uh, temperature runaway is too much and so on. All these aspects are there, which made it very exciting, which is why we've been studying it a lot in my group in these past years. We've done a lot of fundamental studies. We've developed a predictive process model that uh, industry practitioners can use. Um, we've looked at the shape of what happens as the, you know, it's, it's solid coal that's being converted to gases and removed. So empty space is created. What's the shape of this empty space or the underground cavity? We've spent a lot of time looking into that. Flow patterns, we've done CFD computational fluid dynamics simulations and also a lot with reaction rates because that is something that is very close to my heart as well. Now the next topic, which also I'm, uh, somehow I'm equally passionate about lots and lots of things. It, somehow it works, it, it fits in with my personality. And this is the second thing that I wanna to talk to you about and that's automotive catalysis. Um, I'll spend a little less time on this though I'll disappoint some of my students like uh, Shivraj and Prasad and Shruti who've contributed a lot to uh, Vishnu Prasad and uh, Shruti who contributed a lot to this work. So here our idea is to uh, reduce the nitric oxide emissions from uh, automotive uh, automobiles. And uh, the challenge is that you have to reduce uh, NOx when there is a lot of oxygen present. So you want a reduction reaction in an oxygen rich environment. So we've uh, have, uh, we've done a lot of uh, uh, simulation studies and so on. But we've recently also made a catalyst that gives us uh, designed a catalyst that gives us this type, the type of reactivity we want. And this graph is the conversion that we've achieved at different temperatures. I just want you to look at the red lines here, ignore all red dots and lines, uh, ignore all the rest of it. So this, uh, if you have studied a little bit of chemical engineering, you know that this, gives, this is a broad temperature window at which we have high conversion of NO. 
And this is a catalyst that uh, has been really working very well for us. And right now we're looking at why it's working so well. Can we push it a little bit more? Can we make it work at slightly lower temperatures? Can we pull up the conversion where it is 90 or 85 or so a little bit further? Uh, what is there at the catalyst surface in terms of the reactions, the elementary steps of what's going on with uh, nitric oxide? How come we can reduce the nitric oxide to nitrogen when there is so much oxygen and the normal tendency that you would expect is for it to completely oxidize everything. So with, these are some of the things that we are looking at. And this is a very recent work from my group uh, by my PhD scholar Shivraj. I do believe that he may be talking a little bit more about it later in, in this um, chem plus as well. Um, the third thing that I want to talk about is uh, soot formation. This is also for uh, the, mostly right now we're looking at aircraft engines. And there is uh, recently there's been some information that the soot from uh, aircraft that comes out of uh, aircraft engines is going to be regulated. So you have to be really careful in, you know, just because you're at 30,000 feet, you can't get away with uh, polluting um, the environment uh, has been uh, what we are hearing. So we're working on, right now, we don't have a strategy on what to do about it. We're looking at how soot forms, why it forms, under what conditions um, is it higher, and how can we explain it from a sort of a chemical kinetics reaction mechanism uh, type of viewpoint. So the results, again, I will spend only a minute or two. It will take a long time to explain uh, some of the things we've done, although it's still in the beginning stage. This research in my group is at the beginning stage, uh, but it will still take a little bit of that time. So this result is uh, our simulation study. So this is just theoretical math model, Solvon MATLAB, and uh, some other codes and so on. Uh, we've predicted that the soot yield uh, will vary in this manner with the y-axis is the soot yield, and then we have temperature on our x-axis. And all the bars with the different uh, colors show you different inlet um, uh, fuel to oxygen ratios that we are using, phi, which is the equivalence ratio, as it is called. So the fuel in this case is a large hydrocarbon, something with 10 uh, carbons or so. Uh, decane is sometimes what we use. Uh, the actual fuel that's used is uh, jet fuel. Um, and we do plan to go and look at what happens when you actually use jet fuel instead of approximating properties of jet fuel as a normal decane or a mixture of normal decane and a little bit of an aromatic like told me. So we're looking at all that. But meanwhile, we found some interesting study that, um, you know, as you vary the temperature, there is a maximum in the soot yield at every a composition of fuel to oxygen that you envisage in your system. So trying to understand why this is so, we will built a model that seems uh, quite robust and which seems like it will capture the experimental reality very well and help us. First step, I guess, in, in the sort of, you know, how, how you progress in, in these uh, scientific areas, the first step is to understand the phenomena then you find how to control it uh, so that it does good things for us in this case is to reduce the soot formation. Uh, so we are in the first step in as far as this work is uh, concerned. And we know that not only does so it, this is sort of the opposite in a sense of my coal gasification situation from a reaction viewpoint. Here we have a whole bunch of gas phase species uh, in our system. These are nucleating into a solid species, which is the first soot, so to say. And then the soot is growing. So we're making this solid uh, at the end of it. Uh, and you know we, what we want to understand is what happens from a chemistry viewpoint and what drives it and so on. So we're working on that. And uh, hopefully we will have a paper uh, on this in the near future from Praveen and a few others in my lab. So with that, uh, with that short sort of uh, foray into my research, I want to ask you a question. As you saw, a lot of the work that I do is in sort of, you know, conventional areas of chemical engineering and energy and so on. And also I work in automotive uh, uh, emissions, you know, directly not with uh, automobile design or anything like that, but at least, you know, what happens in the tailpipe and how you can control it. 
very frequently when I talk about this, my friends or you know other people will say, hey, anyway, the internal combustion engine is on its way out because we're all going to go uh, EV, we're going to go into electric vehicles. So I want to know your opinion. Um, I don't know the answer, whether internal uh, combustion engines are just going to die and we'll all be driving electric vehicles only. I know what are you know sort of problems associated with thinking about this. I know that there's still enough motivation for me to work with uh, internal combustion engines and uh, from the environmental aspects of it. But I want to hear your opinion on what you think. Just your opinion, no right or wrong answer. Hope you know what to do. You can point your mobile to this QR code that is uh, over there. Rinalni and uh, Priyansh, I want you also to do this because at least it will give me two answers here on the screen. It will open the link and you can uh, vote. Uh, hopefully, if I've set it up right, or you can go in this URL slido.com and type this code with this Q016 and you should be able to vote. So once you vote on the, yeah, there are at least one response I have. So once you uh, vote on this, just please keep it active because I have a few more uh, things to ask of you as we go along as well. So it looks like the mood is very EV um in the session so far yeah uh, predominantly going at although i have some votes for uh, the other things also um maybe the people voting for other are thinking about some i don't know like a hovercraft of some sort or you know something elon musk is sure to come up with in the future something like that is what you're thinking about possible i i don't deny that it's a possibility um so yeah, but I do have some votes for a petrol based IC engine. Great. I thought this is an okay question to ask chemical engineers, right? Because your your, your future is, is sort of going to uh, be determined by what happens um, in this field. So it looks like the mood is very EV. That's no problem. Uh, that's, that's perfectly fine because uh, the electricity for your EV, the generation of the electricity for your EV is also one of the things that generating that in an environmentally better way that works for the local situations of our country is also a problem that we work on. So I don't feel insulted that more of you voted for EV than the other ones. So fantastic. I'm going to move. I have a dozen responses, so that's pretty good. I'm going to move forward and talk a little bit about my experiments with teaching and then get into the women in STEM thing pretty quickly as well. So I've kept this very brief because I don't want to belabor you with, you know, my entire whole experience for these past hajar years. 2002 is when I started. Uh, in uh, This was in IIT Bombay. So I was an assistant and associate professor in IIT Bombay before I moved to IIT Madras. Uh, so this, the start of my academic, I mean, professional academic journey was in uh, IIT Bombay, where I started teaching reaction engineering. And so my first day was, uh, you know, I walked in, there were 100 students, or in 2002, there were 100 undergraduate students in uh, IIT Bombay already. So I walk into this room, I was uh, 28 years old, and these were, I guess, 10 years younger at that point of time little less than 10 years younger to me. So this room filled with um, uh, IIT BTECs, you know, very sort of outgoing, outspoken type of BTECs, mostly male, right? Mostly male is the classroom that I still vividly remember the room in which some old sort of room with an old blackboard I walked in, uh, that was in uh, 2002. Uh, I guess I've come a long way from there. So here I wanted to throw at you a few numbers uh, to give a little bit of perspective. Mostly I think at the end of it, we'll go away with the impression that she is very old and that's fine. I am um, so old that I'm vaccine eligible and I got my shot uh, this morning, by the way. So if you think that's a good thing, you can give me this in the chat box. Uh, I got the co-vaccine prick earlier uh, this morning. So here it is. Um, I have taught 36 semesters 
uh, it's a little bit fuzzy counting I've done, I assure you. So I've th taught th 36 semesters almost on the trot, right? Uh, so the few missing, I'm sure uh, good IIT and calculation will probably suggest you that I may be missing one semester. And that was uh, my uh, pregnancy, I mean, my uh, post-pregnancy, childbirth break, maternity leave that I took for a semester. So uh, the, on April 14th in 2004, I taught a class uh, and I remember the same, that it was the same old classroom, I taught that. And my daughter was born on April 16th. So the subsequent semester to that is when I had a break from teaching. Otherwise, it's been uh, really on the trot. I did have to grade 100 exams um, when, you know, e immediately after I came back from the hospital. Uh, and I'll tell you the most irritating thing was the students' handwritings, right? When they scratch things and they don't box the answers. That was the real, that was... It's still irritating, but it was really irritating when I'd just given birth and come back from the hospital. Uh, but I think it went okay. It wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't difficult to navigate that. And I do remember it mostly with fondness. And then that plus one is the trimester, which I just finished. I finished teaching a jam-packed, like squeezed tight uh, process calculations uh, course this past uh, few months. And... Um, that was that was a really unique experience because it's seven weeks like tuck 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 so many classes packed 118 students on you know it's not even i mean i i think 100 people in a room I, i'm used to now because you know that's what i've been doing since 2002 i stand up in front of 100 people i used to be a little bit nervous not so much anymore as well. but this is 100 people that i can't see that are little black boxes on my computer because this course is completely online and I don't know what they're thinking. Are they sleeping? Are they cursing at me? And how do I do the exams? And so on. But it, it was a, it was really an immensely um, challenging experience. And the uh, only thing I had going was that last year when COVID hit us, we had quickly pivoted to online. Uh, it felt a little bit different because I'd seen all these people for a couple of months. So we'd met in Jan and Feb, and then in March we went online. So that was different. But this trimester was, you know, it was an experience, which is why I put a plus one over there. Now I've taught nearly 40 uh, core and elective courses and labs and so on. So at one point, middle of my uh, past career, I was like, you know, I have to do these labs. I have never done them. It was exhausting uh, because I wear, you know, you have to wear shoes to the lab, right? Because you have to role model uh, these type of uh, practices. So I remember one time I dug out some, normally I don't wear shoes because it's too warm. Um, and I dug out an old pair of uh, closed shoes, which I thought were good sort of safety shoes, wore it to the lab. The sole came off, like part of the sole came off in the middle of lab work. So I kind of got an idea of how, uh, mostly it's the weather. I think in Chennai, it's the weather that makes labs really difficult for uh, students, also for teachers. But it was a good, fun experience nevertheless. Now, there are, again, I've counted, I'm pretty sure I've counted wrong, but there have been so many names of students to remember. And I feel very bad when somebody doesn't know my name and they're like, hey, hi, and so on. I want to not be that person with students that I've taught in class. We spent so much time. We spent, you know, nearly 50 hours together uh, through the course of the semester. I know their handwriting and, you know, I've graded their exams. So there's some intimacy with all that. And I feel really bad when I don't remember someone's names, but it's for this size of brain, it, it, it's one of the things that I really struggle with uh, to remember all the names of all the students that I have taught, although I would love to. So um, now with this online thing, good and bad, right? The good is that suppose I uh, my name to face match from Rinalini got cut in my brain. I can see that her name is in the box below. So, you know, I quickly uh, make the connection. Um, but then many people don't switch on their uh, videos in class. So I I know, so I guess with the online, I know the names, not the faces. 
and in our classroom session i know the faces maybe not the names all the time so for me in my when i think back and reflect upon my teaching journey this one thing that sticks i also wanted to say this is your ah uh, moment that it's been infinite the amount of fun uh, you have to teach all the students over all these years so an ah uh, in the in the chat box would be appropriate now so i wanted to now talk to you about uh, some other kind of numbers and uh, uh, this is the sort of the second uh, thing that so far it has been my uh mostly about my academic journey but now i'm going to put a little bit of perspective about this topic of women in stem in my high school class i'm from mysore a uh, small little pastoral as my daughter calls it town uh, in uh, karnataka and uh, cbsc school very you know standard sort of cbsc school good one um around 40% women right we were more a little less than the uh, guys that was my class and i came to iit madras for my btech and uh, we were around uh, we were yeah we were five out of a class of 45 women out of a class of 45 and this was an anomaly for the 90s this was definitely an anomaly it used to be much less uh, the percentage of women in our undergraduate classes at that point of time i was lucky so or i guess we were all lucky so we were 12% in my btech class i went to the us right uh, for my uh, graduate studies masters at rochester and phd at a uh, place called amherst which is university of massachusetts at amherst so we were about 10% in my phd cohort it was a much smaller class we were about you know a few about it here so we were 10% uh, of the class was women uh, i say 10% but the number is also very very small uh, at this point of time now i am a faculty member in uh, iit madras uh, chemical engineering and uh, i say 6% because it sounds better than saying that we are two women faculty in the department for uh, many years so i wanted to show you this is just my experience right and it's obviously not the same experience that others have but these numbers in terms of percentages are uh, reflective of i believe a problem which is that going from school to college to higher studies uh, to any professional um, Uh, atmosphere i'm not saying that being a prof being a professor is the only uh, uh, you know end goal for uh, a chemical engineering uh, student or for a high school student but at least in this field and it's the same in the other fields as well there's this sort of reduction in numbers and which basically means that you know if you think in terms of mass balance that we are losing we are losing women uh, as we go along um, from high school to college to higher studies to professional endeavors of various sorts including academics um, or corporate research or whatever finance whatever it is so we we're losing it feels like we're losing women um definitely in terms of the workforce uh, the labor force in our country the percentage of uh, women is in whatever whatever sphere that you take it's not it's improving right it's definitely increasing uh, over course of time and in fact this 12% uh, women in my btech class i'm sure it's it's much better now in 2020 than it was in the 90 early 90s when i studied it's improving a lot but it's still not matching up to the population the population is what 50% women so this leaky pipeline this is the term leaky pipeline that i thought that is a very i like hearing that I mean, I don't like that there's a leaky pipeline. Obviously, it, it, it's horrendous and it's really bad. But I, I like thinking about it because it's a good chemical engineering uh, way to think about it. That you have this, you have this uh, pipe or tube into which things are flowing, and there is drop-off points every step of the way from high school to college to uh, wherever you go beyond that as well. And we don't even need to talk about you know uh, at the uh, very highest levels you know like ceo or the equivalent of that i guess is uh, aict chairperson or director of an iit etc we don't even uh, i i think this audience knows very well that those if you look for women in that it's 
countable on the fingers of uh, one hand type of number. So I, I believe that this is a problem and uh, or articulating the problem in this way is uh, uh, important. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, when I was talking about my research, first is to sort of formulate the problem. And then like we did with, like we are doing with our suit to understand, you know, why suit forms, how it forms, where it coming from, etc. And then next you can formulate a whole uh, slew of solutions to address this problem. Maybe not instantly, right? But you don't want to instantly, uh, or you'll not be able to instantly solve the problem, but at least in the course of over the course of time. Okay, now quick question for you, um, or maybe not so quick. Again, on the same slide or uh, poll thing that you have, if you will be so good as to try to answer this again, no wrong answer or anything like that. What's your perspective? Uh, just don't be rude. That's all I, I ask. Be respectful. Um, why are there fewer women uh, than men in chemical engineering programs? I answer it purely from, you know, from a college uh, or, or grad school, graduate school type of viewpoint. That's good enough. You don't have to necessarily think about professional careers. Um, I don't know why, but that's the way I, I framed this uh, question last evening when I was making it. So from the audience, uh, there's, I see about 30 people in the audience. I, I want to know what you think um, is the issue here or what you've seen uh, in your whatever 17, 20 years of uh, life experience. Uh, I'm sure there are overlaps with uh, what I have seen in my 47 years and also some slightly different perspectives that you all bring in as well. So I, I love to hear about um, hear the viewpoints of, of uh, people in audiences on this matter. Tough working conditions, industry jobs. All right. I don't think women are pretty tough, but that's all right. Yeah, I, I do. I do feel a lot about these uh, perceptions that, you know, I, I find that my colleagues in mechanical engineering uh, especially face this, that parents and society and even sometimes the students um, feel like mechanical engineering is not right. It's not a right fit for uh, a woman, for a, a young girl, which is not at all the case. I mean, there's lots of mechanical engineers, for example, doing AI, and those are not, uh, you know, areas where uh, there, there's any problem for of gender. So gender norms for jobs. Yeah, it's it shouldn't also possibly flip over to the other side because I've heard some of the younger male uh, students feel that there's a lot of preference for women in jobs these days. Um, denied opportunities. Uh, yeah, definitely there's been a lot of, uh, lot of this in the past at least. And it's fantastic that uh, you, you write it like this because just recognizing it and calling it out is the first step to trying to make it better. Um, field work, yeah, maybe if you have to go deep into a coal mine and dig things out and so on, it's possibly considered the physical differences are uh, considered important. Yeah, I do agree with this comment that uh, industrial working conditions are not appropriate for women is an age old belief. It's not necessarily uh, true. There are people thinking girls can't even clear jelly. Okay, that sounds too absurd for me too. I know, I do know this. Yeah, I have heard this, you know, that uh, this exam is too difficult for girls, but um, we know that. I think we know that this is not true at all. And we are there, I mean, we've, we've seen these exams. We set these exams too. Uh, I haven't set it this year because I'm not supposed to tell you if I have. Uh, they're not aware about opportunities in this field. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I agree. Societal perceptions, gender norms, tough, work, tough working conditions. I uh, think I'll go with this age-old belief comment 
on that preconceptions that engineering is not for women women society is dominated by men yeah lack of leaders in the field i do like this point as well i also strongly believe that you know when you do a visioning for your own future and even if you don't formally sit down and do that each of us is right each of us is at every point in our life thinking you know what's ahead for me what should i study what should i do beyond that and so on and in that visioning if you don't see a person like you in uh, in a situation um that you may get into then you avoid that right you know you avoid that and you go into uh, something else i i often talk about um just to sort of put things in perspective talk about men who may want to be in nursing and there are people that are interested in that and you know what they say right you should do something that you're passionate about that you're good at that uh, also can put money or you know put food on your table and a roof over your head and which is good for the entire world so if you if you have to find these intersections the first point is what are you passionate about and if you're passionate about one thing and you're barred from that because you're x y z whatever it is um i also like the example of left handed people it's like everything all doors everything are made. the world is sort of built for right handed people and if we go on doing that that means that you're excluding left handed people increasingly right and you exclude left handed person uh, and then the in the next phase of the design there's no information that this isn't working for left handed people so you again exclude left handed people again so you go forward in time in 50 100 200 years down the lane it's almost like you know uh, left handed people are not welcome and that's sort of where i think we are at uh, right now and but it's good it, it's good that we are thinking about it so many of you have expressed i see also in the comment box uh, people are talking about some things and recognizing that there is a problem and these are the points of pain itself is a very good first step so i'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk a, uh, do a little bit of storytelling now right give you a break from having to think and type and so on and talk to you about a few stories that i have uh, encountered in my uh, life that i i like to talk about um first is on rosalind franklin and if you've heard of this name you can put a, a thumbs up in the comment box for me So Rosalind Franklin, uh, I didn't put her face. Uh, I didn't take her photo and put it on this face, but I did put down this um, uh, photograph, and it's called Photo Fifty uh, One. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, Rosalind was a very good, skilled pair of experimental hands working in X-ray diffraction. and she made this photograph in the lab this wasn't computer simulation this wasn't you know gentle non field work this wasn't law this it was long hours in the lab intensely focusing a microscope trying and trying and trying and failing every time trying and trying again this type of hard work which uh, uh, there is a perception that uh, women should not or cannot do without compromise help them whatever so rosalind franklin took this photograph and of course i mean i'm sure this wasn't her first attempt and this is the foundation on which the dna structure has been uh, the the you know the double helix structure for uh, dna has been uh, it was conjectured and proved people that got credit for it were two men uh, in her uh, sphere who, who in her group that is of course you know them watson and crick they got the nobel prize and really famous people and you know uh, double dna double helix you immediately oh yeah yeah those two guys watson and crick uh, but the truth of the matter is that the the core of that uh, proposition or that proposal which has stood the test of time which means it's most as far as we know it's the correct structure for dna and so much they've been lauded about having solved this very important scientific puzzle for us and opened out so many areas of of science for us the core of that was in the uh, was in the photograph taken by rosalind franklin and she gets no credit pretty much uh, 
no credit has been uh, attributed to her um, for this wonderful work that she's done. So I read a book, I read the Watson and Crick book about their journey in discovering the structure of DNA and I loved it. It's an enthralling story. You know, if you're a person in science, you just love to hear about how these people are messing around in the lab and this and that and so on. So I really loved it. But then it was a few years later that I discovered that there's a backstory to that and uh, Rosalind's name popped up and I've read a lot about her and I hope you will too. Second is uh, Carla Imerwar. Uh, Carla, uh, this is her uh, maiden name. Her uh, married name is uh, Haber. And that's a name that is well known to uh, many of us. Fritz Haber is you know, one of the most famous uh, chemical engineering scientists that, and we hear so much about the Haber. We've learned about the Haber process from uh, right from high school. And we've also, if you read his story, it's very impressive very hardworking uh, person who played around with thousands of catalysts before he finally found the one that really works for uh, ammonia synthesis. And that, of course, opened the door out for fertilizers and almost all of, of the productive agriculture that we do is, you can trace it back to Haber's um, ability to make a catalyst that can uh, do this reaction for us. Carla was his wife and she was known during their college days, uh, Carla was known as a very, very bright uh, brain and equally as Fritz and they were uh, mates in, uh, I, I believe during the college studies. But after uh, she married, her job was to serve, to keep the children away from when the scientific minds, all male, were uh, uh, talking in their house and um, uh, to serve tea, basically, make sure that serve as in, it, she, I don't think she had to make it. They had people to help out with that because by then uh, Fritz was a really famous scientist earning a lot of money and so on. But make sure the arrangements were, that was her job. And it's, uh, I think it's a big shame that you know a mind like hers was uh, relegated to this type of task rather than being the type of given the type of encouragement that her husband got um, to go forward in his scientific journey. So this is a sort of her tombstone here in the picture in the middle, the little uh, rock slash trunk like thingy. I don't think you can read the lettering, but it says her uh, dates of uh, living and so on. Uh, this is me in front of Haber's house in uh, Berlin. So this it's the downstairs portion where all the scientific minds were talking. I haven't uh, taken a photo of the upstairs where Carla was um, looking after the children and making, getting the tea arranged for the minds in the water. So I, I, you know, the story stayed with me. Uh, this was just last year that I went to Berlin and did this. Um, I'll skip the story actually. She's a runner, Catherine Switzer is a runner who wasn't no, I won't skip it. I'll take 30 seconds. Um, she wasn't allowed to participate in marathons because they said that women shouldn't run. Um, you know, it'll, uh, I don't know, it'll do something to them. They shouldn't, they're not allowed. But she stood up against this and fought her way through and she participated in the most famous marathon, which is the Boston Marathon. Somehow, she's the first, first ever official woman to finish that race. Uh, through thick and thin and a friend of mine met with her uh, a few years ago and he went to a marathon in the US and he got me this autographed copy of her book so she's uh, here she says Preeti Hope um, you have Preeti you have all the goods to be great is what she says, be fearless. Her motto is be fearless and she promotes that a lot. So these are three stories which I believe tell us that some of the things that you all talked about in terms of poor representation of women in various uh, spheres, lack of role models for us to look forward to and to visualize for our own future. And a lot of perceptions which are just, you know, they're not rooted in logic or reality, but they're there and they're very strong. And this is the reason why that we have this inequity um, at this point of time. So there is, a, um, Nani, with your permission, I have a last couple of things to talk about. Uh, is that all right in terms of timing? Ma'am, we'll take the audience questions in, uh, uh, I think we have like two, three questions, couple of questions. You can take another five minutes and then we'll address the questions. 
Perfect. Yeah. Five minutes is perfect for me. So I want to make a thesis that chemical engineers have the innate ability to be diverse. And uh, here's one reason why I think we can be diverse. The type of uh, study that we do, right, from separation processes to catalysts and reactions like I do, looking at new material, even in, this is purely from our own department that I've seen. We have a bunch of people working with new materials. We have a lot of very good work in our control systems and thermodynamics and also bioengineering. So if you just look at the profile of chemical engineers uh, in our uh, department, it's so diverse. So I feel like we have an innate ability to be diverse because our, our, our course of study itself is like that. So there's physics, there's math, there's a lot of chemistry, and there's a lot of other uh, areas also that we touch uh, when we uh, study chemistry. Now I have this uh, few names, there's many more like this. And I want you to think about, uh, it's a question I'm gonna ask you, but probably not give you time to answer. Arthur Fry, he's the inventor of the post-it note. There's Beatrice Hicks, she's the founder of something called the Society of Women Engineers, which is a very good network for uh, women engineers and very popular, grown worldwide, started in the US, it's spread everywhere. Frances Arnold, I think you guys will remember her. She won the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2018. And she's a very, you should follow her and see the work that she does. Sorry about this mess up in formatting. Arthur D. Little is the founder of uh, Arthur D. Little Consulting and they're known as the first and foremost technical consulting firm. They brought this idea of consulting into the technical sphere and they're very big and possibly a job opportunity for you all in the future. There's Jerzy Buzek, he's the former prime minister of Poland and still he's there in the European parliament and so on, a politician. And of course, you all know Harsha Bhokle, I didn't give any description. What is the common thread among uh, all of these? That's my question to you. So what do the inventor of the post-it note, Francis Arnold, winner of Nobel Prize in Chemistry, Harsha Bogle, uh, of course, come up with some other names, uh, Mukesh Ambani. Um, what is Mukesh Ambani now? Some, it's something very rich, something or the other. What do all these people have in common? One person answers and then we move on. I led you to this also. No? Yes? Priyansh, you have an answer for me? Okay, I'm counting down from 10, and then I'm going to answer it myself. Thank you. So this is what, the, and look at it. He invented the post-it note. And there's this woman who uh, found the uh, women in STEM aspect important enough to set up this humongous network for uh, women. And then there's a politician. There's also a polymath, by the way, Indian uh, polymath. So we have people in AI, we have, we have people everywhere, right? So I believe that it, chemical engineers are inherently in their thinking so sort of diverse that for us to uh, you know uh, look at a, a problem of inequity and change it is very easy in fact it's easier than for other people that's my uh, thesis and uh, I do think that um, so I'm going to try to wind up very quickly now so we can answer some questions. I do think that nevertheless, despite the fact that we're so awesome like this and we have so many people doing so many different things with their lives, we have fewer opportunities for women because it's the problem is very complex and there's a like a not only is the problem a big one, it also has a complex sort of intermingling of uh, factors, including, you know, perceptions and, and so on. But it is the kind of problem that we do like to solve, right? And through concerted efforts and just being open-minded, you know, through a lot of uh, mentorship. I'm so grateful to you all for reaching out and saying, you know, let's have this type of talk. We haven't had this type of uh, uh, a talk on on this topic in uh, uh, chemical engineering student led conference before even this is a very good uh, positive step and i i believe i firmly believe that we will uh, solve this problem so i put this up in my linkedin it's a um, 
uh, scramble, uh, jumble words uh, puzzle that I put together, things holding women in chemical engineering back. I'm not going to let you solve this. I'll share it with you later. But I do hope that through the course of, of this interaction, even if you hadn't before, right, which I, I sort of think you would have anyway, please think about the problem that there is this leaky pipeline as you, you know, think about your own situation going from school to college and whatever beyond, how there's fewer and fewer women and we're dropping off, we're losing women as we go along. And why is this? What can each of us do to make sure that this uh, improves? Okay, that's all. I'm, my next slide says I'm done. But before that, I want to ask you quickly if you have anything to say back to me. Uh, but at this point, also, Rinalini, I'll hand it back to you. We can talk through the questions as people type answers to this if they wish to as well. Over yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Jose here, and this has asked a question. You we'll started the query session for now. Hopefully, uh, I can answer this. Is it a tough question? Is it a tough question? It's very generic, ma'am. So perfect. Can do that. Uh, yeah. So. Can you please share your thoughts on new trends and opportunities in chemical engineering and process engineering? And there are a list of uh, things that the person has mentioned, which is including machine learning, augmented intelligence, digitalization, value plus solutions, uh, the upcoming fields in the uh, domain yeah. is what they've asked. Your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, great. I don't have, a, obviously there's no like, a perfect answer for this. Uh, my opinion is that we are, and that's what I was trying to also bring up a few slides ago, we are inherently trained uh, to be good at a whole host of things. And also, I believe there is quite a lot of agility that we build in in the chemical engineering um, uh, training, you know, whatever undergraduate or postgraduate and so on. So getting into uh, uh, artificial intelligence or other sort of what are looking like new and upcoming areas seems a very uh, good and easy-ish leap for uh, chemical engineers. In fact, we are seeing this trend as well. Uh, by the way, this uh, aspect of data science and uh, machine learning, if you look at, we've seen even in IIT Madras itself, we've seen that the participation and the contributions of chemical engineers can be really significant. And there are a number of reasons for that. I think one could be that uh, in uh, uh, industry, in chemical industry, uh, there is a lot of data already available. So we are, we are routine, we, not just now, we didn't just say, okay, let's collect a lot of data because we want to do data science and a lot of math to it. We've been doing this routinely for generations now, which means that uh, we understand what it means and being able to analyze it using whatever new algorithms that have come up and so on is easy for us. But the other, that's one reason, but the other reason also is our, uh, what's, what, if you look at the curriculum uh, in chemical engineering, it's very diverse. So we have aspects of uh, which, if you see our intersections, our intersections with the material science uh, department or, or study of material science, mechanical engineering, you know, in terms of various aspects, in, including combustion and so on, which I work on, which is many times considered a stronghold of uh, mechanical engineers. And when you look at, uh, yeah, we have overlaps also with computer scientists. And so, so I feel that in and of itself, it's an area that allows you to be agile and move to uh, other aspects. There are those of us that are very, in a way, in conventional chemical engineering, but that doesn't mean that there aren't others that are uh, very much at the forefront of what is trending nanotechnology or bioinformatics or, or right now AI and ML and so on. So yeah, I, I think it's a possibility. I have one answer on what's your key takeaway meanwhile. I hope for more. <laughs> You have another yes, question for me. You do have this knack of keeping a pie in there every pie. So yeah, they have the fingers in every pie. So yeah. Um, the, the this question is from Divyansh, and uh, he uh, so they ask uh, that which is a better option, having a versatile skill set or uh, picking up something and getting to the depth of it. 
Yeah, this is a tough question for me to answer, of course, because, um, yeah, so I, my personality is to try to do lots of things, right? We like really nuts about lots of things, you know, like we said at the beginning, you're running and chemical engineering and teaching and, and so on as well, as well. And, um, you know, it, in a way, I would say this type of uh, versatility or at least exposure to different things feeds into my creativity and it makes me feel, somehow it makes me happier. But I do know people that, uh, actually even myself, I'm a little bit wistful sometimes about, you know, not being the type of person that just, uh, for example, math, I loved math, right? So I, I think wistfully about maybe if I just shut out all the other noise and just went into math or had gone into math deeper and deeper and deeper, right? Would that have been good for me is what I... Anyhow, for me, what is uh, giving me happiness is, you know, what is making me feel... I'm smiling a lot, as you can see. So I'm enjoying myself. So what is making me feel that type of enjoyment and upliftment uh, is what I want to go for. So I, I don't like to do things uh, with some sort of very specific end goal, which is strange to hear from a person that spent four and a half years doing a PhD because there the end goal is submitting your thesis and getting your degree and everything you do has to funnel into that end goal. But I, I don't know if I'm very fond of that type of approach. I'd rather do things that are really fun and attractive and I'm feeling passionate about uh, in the moment. So you need to maybe ask yourself, uh, Divyansh, is, is what I think. Each of us is different. And, and there is, by the way, there is space in the world for you uh, to be whichever go in whichever direction or even a mix of both you know six months of the year i'm like da, 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 dabbling in lots of things and then six months i sit down and write a book for example if that's what you want to do so that's my non-answer to your question okay ma'am that was a good answer it was a really great answer and uh now, uh, one last question. Uh, so you are a marathon runner. So how does uh, uh, how does that influence your work as a researcher? Uh, OK, so yeah, I think it's, um, so I'm a runner, first of all, right? I, I've been running a lot all my, or at least a little bit all my life, uh, right from my school days. I think I was 10 years old when I started a uh, little bit of running. And in those early days, it sort of helped me um, keep good health. Uh, that that was, and it was a very good motivating factor at that point of time. Uh, but now uh, I have run seven uh, full marathons so far. And there were a couple of times, this is a while ago, several years ago. I don't know what got into our head, but we ran uh, to Mahabalipuram, which is 50 kilometers away. So we ran from here to Mahabalipuram. So uh, I, I'm not doing so much of running anymore. But what I feel that all those uh, times uh, when I've been on the road, there is that end goal, which I was trying to dissuade Divyansh from focusing so much on. The end goal is that finish line. You have to get there. And uh, it's very hard. And the 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 feelings that bubble up, like, yaar, let's give up. Let's take an auto. Or let's just sit down and somebody will uh, pick me up. And what does it matter? What am I doing this for anyway? Who cares whether I reach Mahapripuram or... I just flag a ride from somebody and um, drive over there, etc. Those these feelings frequently come to you when you're on the road, especially in Chennai, where the weather is never ever cooperative. So this Mahabalipuram craziness we did in December, still it was boiling hot and there was like zero tree cover in that point in OMR. So in those times, um, you sort of say, okay, uh, let's just go five minutes, see what happens. Let's just go one more kilometer and, and then take a call later. After that, I'll let you, by the way, I'm going to stop sharing this. 
um, we'll take a decision at that point. So I feel like the, my research journey has also been like that. It's full of frustrations. It's full of roadblocks, from silly stuff. Like, like right now I'm sitting on a bill uh, that I haven't managed to pay for some consumable gases because there is fund in the project I need to pay it from, but not in the consumables head. So it's like, you know, you have to, what kind of uh, uh, trap is this, right? It's such a weird trap to be in. And so like this, it's just, this one is just a silly thing, but sometimes you don't know how to, you see something, you don't know how to explain it at all. You've tried 10 different ideas, you've brainstormed the heck out of it, but you, are, you aren't figuring it. So this, these stumbling blocks all the time, codes, I've written lines and lines of code during my, uh, my PhD and it'll gnaw, it'll break somewhere. You run the compiler here, there, everywhere, but you, it just breaks somewhere. So there's all these the research journeys peppered with frustrations. It feels like mostly it's frustrations and then there's one or two moments where it feels good. Uh, but I feel like my running helps me stay okay, say, okay, it doesn't matter. There are these momentary things, but I'll get past it. Like I've gotten to the next kilometer, I'll get past this one to the next whatever I need to do for research. So I think it, it does I definitely think it helps me. Um, my family will agree because if I don't exercise and run, I'm really horrid to live with because my body and mind are very used to it. It's also a little bit of, it's a little meditative, running uh, longer distances is also meditative, meditative. So I think I need it. So it makes me, a, first of all, a better person, more positive person, and also helps me overcome these frustrations in research. So hopefully that answers your question. Yes, ma'am, that was pretty insightful. I mean, your uh, marathon running definitely has a great influence on your work in terms of the motivation so yeah and health little at least <laughs> and, little yes that is there ma'am that is always there <laughs> yeah yes ma'am it was a, it was a great having you for the lecture series ma'am now i think the questions are done uh okay. I, I i personally enjoyed listening to the talk it was a, it's a great that you know to see inspiring stories like yours uh and you know motivates people like me because i myself am a woman in stem so yeah yes uh thank you so much for gracing this event ma'am and uh, the participants uh, in the various events can directly go to their activities and uh, the lecture series will be resuming at 5 pm uh, so thank you for joining us today or i